be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Hello, my friend. My name is Duke Duvall. Welcome to another segment of Conquering Your Giants. You know, for years now, we've been getting together every week in order to get into the Word of God, that the Word of God would get into us. Uh, somebody has said that this book is not a book of inspiration only, although it inspires us, doesn't it? It's not a book of education, although it is a book that gives us education. But rather than inspiration and education, it is really a book of transformation. And God wants to take you, my brother. He wants to take you, my sister. He wants to take us from glory to glory to glory. And His Word becomes that light unto our path, that lamp unto our feet. And in that process, to the degree that we invest our lives, our energy, our resources into God's Word, we get a return that is literally out of the world. Amen? And so as we think about getting into God's Word and how it's going to be applied to our lives, we will be contrasting in today's program worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. It's important that we are wise in God's eyes. Amen? Not in our own conceits, not in our own comparisons of people. I know that one time when I was speaking in Tokyo, I felt like a pretty tall guy. At 6'1", I had about a thousand business people in the audience. And for part of the presentation, the president of that Japanese company had them come up on the stage, some of their leadership team. And we stood there together for a photo. Well, a lot of those men and the ladies were uh, quite short compared to my 6'1". And so if I were to think only of that moment in my life, I would have seemed like a pretty tall guy. But God in His wonderful wisdom, and I believe with His sense of humor as well, had one of my very next speaking assignments to be to the Atlanta Hawks professional basketball team. And when we took a photo in the locker room before their game, I looked like a first grader compared to these 6'11 and 7 feet guys. And so what we find here is that we cannot make our comparisons among ourselves. The Bible says that's very unwise to do that. But rather you and I think about that transformation. God saved us. As the old saying goes, He loved us so much that He saved us where we were. But because He loves us so much, He's not going to let us stay there. He's going to take us from glory to glory to glory. But that has to be done in sync with Him. That's why we have to be wise in God's eyes, not in the eyes of man, not in our own uh, heart and conjecture, because we don't even know how to judge things based upon the deceitfulness of our heart. And so when we get into the Word of God, we see that it's not just uh, some old dry and ancient religious manuscript as people might find in tribal religions, but rather it is the living Word of God. The Bible says it's active, it's sharp, it penetrates us, it divides us, soul, spirit. It gets to the heart of who we are and who God has made us to be. We stop dealing with assumptions and we deal with the realities and the facts of life. For example, let me ask you a question that I sometimes ask when I'm speaking to uh, an event. I have an audience there and I say, how many of you here would jump out of a plane for a million dollars but no parachute? Of course, I don't see any takers. Nobody's raising their hand. Yeah, I want in on that because that seems so unwise. It seems deadly. But I say, you're making a very, very big assumption. What if that plane that I was going to give you a million dollars to jump out of with no parachute is parked right there in the parking lot? Changes things, doesn't it? Let's try another one. How many days, excuse me, how many months of the year have 28 days? Well, somebody might be thinking in a leap year, uh, none of them. Uh, because even February, which normally has 28, it would have 29. But again, you're making an assumption. The real answer, how many months of the year have 28 days? The answer is 12. All of them have 28 days, and some have even more. And so it is that we have to stop making assumptions when it comes to life and godliness and the promises of God. We're going to be looking today at the wisdom of Solomon. 
Uh, some of you have read my book, How to Conquer Giants, which was uh, what really precipitated our coming together here with WTJR and began doing a weekly program called Conquering Your Giants. Solomon, of course, was the wealthiest and wisest man, according to the Bible, that was ever born of human parents. Now, he didn't listen to his own advice a lot of the time, but he had the wisdom and to trust and obey, as the old hymn goes, that's the only way that we'll really have joy in the Lord. And that the joy of the Lord would then become our strength if we are walking and keeping in touch with God. Every world religion is trying to answer four primary questions. I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way. But virtually every religious endeavor... Now, I certainly understand the gospel of Jesus Christ and a relationship with Christ is not religion. But follow my train of thought here because the people that you and I will witness to in the course of our lives, and I pray that you are somebody witnessing because the Bible says, He who winneth souls is wise. So if we're talking about God's wisdom, we have to see things from God's perspective, and that includes seeing people from God's perspective. But let me back up and talk about the four questions that virtually everybody is trying to answer. And they gravitate toward cults, or they gravitate toward atheism, or they gravitate toward some other world religion. And they miss the truth. And the devil, of course, doesn't care how you miss the truth just as long as you miss the truth. But basically, every person is asking, where did I come from? Where am I going? What's the purpose of my life? And what do I count as being moral versus immoral or evil? Now, if we get ahead of ourselves and really get ahead of God, um, I'm using human terminology, we could never get ahead of God, but when we try to get ahead of His timing for our lives, things just don't go well. It's like taking a rosebud and trying to take pliers to it and open it ahead of its bloom time, you're going to destroy it. And so it is that if Jeremiah 29, 11 is the confirmation that God has plans for His children, and they're good plans, aren't they? Plans to prosper and not to harm. Plans to give hope and an expected end. Then we have to get in step with God. I use this example. It might be too simplistic, but it was good for the school children that I was teaching. I said, what if I was in a parade with you and we were making our way through a big city? And I said to you, I think we're going to turn up at the next intersection. And sure enough, we turned. And pretty soon I told you we were going to come upon uh, a large float. And it was a, a float of a man holding a flag. And all of a sudden we pass by and there it is. A man in a float holding a flag. And time and time again, I get it right. And then all of a sudden, I reveal the secret to you. I have an earpiece, and the pilot in the helicopter is directing me as to what's coming up on the parade route. Well, we both get a chuckle out of that, and you realize that I didn't have supernatural powers. But the man that was above, looking down on the parade, could see the entire progression. And so it is that God who sees from above and who knows all things, think about this, God never has learned anything because He's always known everything. He knows everything about you. Things that you don't know. Here's an easy example from the Bible. How many hairs do you have on your head right now? You don't know that, but God does. How many sparrows will fall in your county in the coming days, let's say in the next seven days? You don't know that answer, but God does. And so if we are going to try to answer these very important and vital questions that virtually every one of us has hardwired into our system, where did we come from? Where are we going? And in this earthly stretch, what's the purpose of life? And what is it that defines for us that which is moral or good versus that which is evil? I want you to look at your screen and I want to kick this off, this program, and maybe a couple of programs as it relates to wisdom. If we are going to be wise in God's eyes, not wise in our own eyes, we have to get into the heart of God. And the heart of God is revealed 
in the Word of God. Take a look on your screen at these following scriptures. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, verse 3, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, verse 4, to give subtlety to the simple to the young man knowledge and discretion. Five, a wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. Now we'll look at those again in just a little while, but I want to set up our study for today with this thought. In ancient China, according to an old story, there was a man who had one horse, and he was actually fairly wealthy by the standards of the Chinese peasants of that day. But this one horse got away. And now then the village people nearby came out to his little farm and said, We are here to share in your bad news. We're sorry for you. But the wise old Chinaman, he said, Is it bad news or is it good news? Who could say? The people scratched their heads. They said, how could this be good news? But you see, just five days later, that wild horse, he wanted to be a wild horse, he's leading back to the stable five real wild horses. And now then this man has the one that he had broken. He thought he wanted something. The grass is greener on the other side, as the saying goes. But that horse didn't like being out there. He liked being back in the stable. He liked the food. And so he comes back to the old farmer. And now then he's leading five wild horses with him. Well, this old farmer is wealthy now beyond any means based upon the standard of that area. And so what do you think the townspeople did? They came running out. We're here to share in your good news. And he looked at these horses and he said, is it good news or could it be bad news? Who could say? Well, they knew he was crazy now. Who wouldn't want to have the wealth and, and all that goes with that by the standards of that day? And so now then, this farmer's 12-year-old son is helping him to break the wild horses. And in one of the riding accidents, as they are breaking this bucking horse, he's thrown against a tree and violently breaks his leg in two places. Well, what do you think the villagers came out to do when they heard of the news? You're right. They came out and they said, we're here to share in your bad news. We're sorry. But the wise old Chinaman said, is it really bad news or is it good news? Who could say? Well, they knew he was crazy now. What good could come out of his 12-year-old boy having a severely broken leg that they are fighting to keep from having to amputate? But you see, in that rural area in China that at the time was in a major war with Japan, Little recruits as young as 9 and 10 years old were bring, being brought into the army. And this 12-year-old boy was spared military duty because he was laid up with a broken leg. My friend, God has a plan, and we don't always understand that plan. And we cannot jump to conclusions and make assumptions. Remember the million-dollar offer to jump out of a plane? If you had known that it was sitting on the parking lot... Wouldn't you like to collect that million dollars? My friend, when you and I get into the Word of God and we begin to listen to why He has given us this wisdom, I say it again, it's not just about education and it's not just about inspiration. It is really about transformation. I want you to look at the opening of the Proverbs one more time. Proverbs 1, verses 1 through 5. Take a look on your screen. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge, and discretion. Listen to verse 5. A wise man will hear... And will increase learning. 
And a man, I could say just as easily, and a woman of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. My friend, a lot of times when I'm speaking at a business function, or even sometimes when I'm preaching, I will sometimes come down from the platform and just put two chairs facing each other. So just picture, I'm sitting in one chair and a volunteer from the audience is facing me. And I say to the audience, and I want you to picture this right now, picture that I'm looking over the shoulder of somebody that you know, somebody that does not know Christ or who's at least shown no regard for God and His Word. I'm looking over the shoulder and I'm seeing a screen, a movie screen, and he's looking over my shoulder and he's seeing a completely different screen behind me. This screen is the screen of worldly wisdom. It's the screen based upon get all that you can. It's the screen that is basically saying live the American dream, work hard, accumulate as much as you can, and then retire at 60 if possible or 70 and walk the beaches of Florida collecting shells until you die. My friend, what kind of life is that based upon eternity and based upon the Word of God? Now then, here I am seated in a chair and I'm looking over his shoulder and I see eternity. And I see that God has set eternity in the hearts of man. And so I know that I'm looking at the truth. I'm seeing Jesus Christ crucified. I'm seeing Him raised to the newness of life. I'm seeing that the future is about eternity. It's not about this world. It's not about what we can accumulate, what we can put in the bank, how soon we can retire, how soon we can get away to some warm climate and basically check out until the day we die. My friend, you and I are part of a plan. And if we're really going to be wise in God's eyes, we have to begin to answer these questions from a biblical perspective. The four that I mentioned to you before, the four that are addressed in virtually every world religion. Where did we come from? Where are we going when this life is over? What's the purpose of this earthly existence? And what is it that defines what is moral and what is evil? Everybody is trying to answer that. You know, as I've had more than 30 years experience in prison ministry, people inside, they thought that they were going to get away with it. And I see now very clearly after more than 30 years of ministry that there are many people who on a very subtle note certainly not overtly criminal as though somebody is about to be locked up for the act. And yet, as the Bible says, there's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end leads to death or to destruction. How many people took a shortcut in business and they were so sure that that was going to be the answer to their problems and it made matters worse and eventually that business died. It was a way that seemed right and the end lead, led to the death of that business. It leads to the death of a marriage when people take one another for granted, when they take shortcuts, when they have affairs, when they do those things that in the moment seemed right, but according to God's standard it was all wrong. Maybe you're facing something right now. Maybe, maybe you're addicted. Maybe you've made some choices in life that have caused you to seem like you're in shackles. Not in a man-made prison, perhaps. And yet I do know that we have men and women who are incarcerated that watch this program. And my heart goes out to you, you and your family. I've used this illustration before with those who are incarcerated. But really, all of us need to be mindful of this. When I was preaching in Australia years ago, and I was speaking the following day after uh, in New Zealand at a business conference. I had that one day off in between to fly from Australia to New Zealand and then to be prepared that third morning to be able to teach at a business seminar. And so I used my day off to find a rental car and to drive out to Mount Cook. Mount Cook is the highest mountain in New Zealand. And it's where Edmund Hillary, who would become Sir Edmund Hillary, knighted by the Queen of England because he was the first man to conquer Mount Everest. And so here I was in his native country of New Zealand. Here I was on the highest mountain peak in New Zealand. I was at the base. I certainly wasn't at the top. 
I was taking in the beautiful scenery, taking pictures, even a picture of the statue that New Zealanders had made to Edmund Hillary. They were proud of him. That of all of the nations of the world, it was their nation of New Zealand that had the one who made it to the peak of Mount Everest first. A mountain that has claimed more than 200 human lives. A mountain that is more than 29,000 feet high. Now then, I'm out there taking pictures and enjoying the scenery, but I had no idea that just down the road from me, four European mountain climbers had just plunged to their deaths. I saw it on the news station that night. Of course, they speak English in New Zealand, and so I was able to see the newscast. And they don't censor the news the same way we do here in the U.S. And so it was a very gruesome picture of four bodies. They're at the bottom of the ravine. They had fallen from the high cliff. And what struck me in that tragedy, even one step beyond the fact that they were all dead, is that that lead rope still tied them all together. Now, if I were to ask you, what do you think happened on the high cliffs of Mount Cook that afternoon? You would be correct in saying that one of them slipped and fell and pulled the other three down with them. Now, I've told that story for years. It's a true story that happened while I was there. But it's as though the Holy Spirit sort of prompted me about a year ago to say, that's not exactly the accurate story, the way you're telling it. And so, of course, today you can go online, you can go back and find newscasts and newspaper reports from all over the world. And so I did. I went to the New Zealand paper for that day, and I found where three men and the daughter of one of the men had fallen to their deaths that day. My friend... When I look at that picture and I saw that one had slipped and four had died, it was a visual that I'll never forget. And I pass it on to virtually every audience that I speak to because you may not really think so much about the people that are tethered to your lead rope. But you're leading people based upon the wisdom that you are applying or the lack of wisdom that you're applying. And I would often say when I'm in a prison, how many of you here, if you could snap your fingers and keep your sons and your daughters from ever being incarcerated in a man's prison, how many of you would do it? And of course, every hand goes up. Anybody who has been incarcerated doesn't want their son or daughter to be incarcerated. And I say to those men, and sometimes if I'm on the women's side of the prison, I say, that's a very worthy goal that you would never want your children to be incarcerated in men's prisons. But I say to them, it's not a big enough goal. Because if your son, if your daughter were to be incarcerated in a man's prison, a county jail, a federal penitentiary, any one of the institutions where they might be locked up for five days or five years or five lifetimes, they will be issued a release date. Now, they might be carried out of there in a body bag when they die inside that prison, but they will leave that institution, right? But my friend, if you have a son or a daughter and they end up being incarcerated in hell, they will not be issued a release date. They will never get out. And some of you today, you have forgotten that there are little eyes upon you and they're watching night and day. Little ears that quickly take in every word you say. Little hands so willing to do everything you do for that little boy or little girl who wants to grow up and be like you. You're that little person's hero. You're the wisest of the wise. And in their world about you, no suspicions ever rise. They cling to you devoutly, hold to all you say and do. Because they're waiting for that day when they can grow up and be just like you. My friend, they are tethered to you. In that case, by birth... You are tethered to another, your spouse, by choice and by oath and covenant. And maybe that has been broken. But my friend, you are tethered to people that you are influencing right now. And you are either influencing them for Christ or you're influencing them away from Christ. You are helping to draw people together. The Bible calls it gathering. And he says, if you are not gathering, I count that you are scattering. My friend, that is not something that God can bless or will bless. 
If your role in life is causing people to stumble, it's because you are not applying God's wisdom. God honors His Word, and His Word works. And it is worthy of every effort that we make. I often say when I'm teaching students that if you take a little thimble of your life and you offer it to God, God will give you a big cup and He'll pour back the blessings. If you offer God a big cup of your life, He'll pour a bucket full of blessings. And if you offer God all of you, He has already offered all of Himself. He loved the world so much and He loved you so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish. Think of it but have everlasting life. My friend, you are going to be alive 10,000 years from now. And we love to sing, don't we? When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. But here's the reality, and I hope you hear my heart on this. Your loved ones, some who are tied to your lead rope, will not have trusted Christ. I pray it's not because you didn't try. But in that trying, in that giving them the truth, it now becomes between them and God. My friend, some of the very people that eat at your table, that work in your business, that you see in a social setting on an ongoing basis, they will have been in hell for 10,000 years when you and I, dying in Christ, will have been with Him for 10,000 years. There's much more I want to say to you about wisdom and leading people that are attached to you in one way or another. Leading them up the steep cliffs and not putting them in harm's way. And so join me again next week. Before we sign off, let me pray for you as we undertake this very important subject of being wise in God's eyes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you so much for the opportunity to open this word of instruction. This book that is not just about education or inspiration, but it is a book of transformation. Lord, you have called us in Ephesians 5.1 to be imitators of Christ. And I'm asking in the name of Jesus that you help everyone watching this program today to take to heart and to take seriously what it means to be in step with your perfect word and perfect will and to be out of step with your perfect word and perfect will. Lord, we're all a work in progress. All of us desperately need you. Help us to see just how desperate we are for you and for your word and for your son who brings us to you. It's in Jesus that we pray and thank you. Amen. Contact Duke Duvall in care of WTJR TV 16, 222 North 6th Street in Quincy, Illinois, 62301. Or go to Duke's website at www.dukeduvall.com. Be sure and join us next week for Conquering Your Giant. See, as this overpowering giant in your life right now, or what do you see? Of whom shall I be afraid? Of what shall I be afraid? What is it that's gripping you with this fear? You need to deal with that, my friend. You need to say, where has my focus been? Have I been looking at these set of circumstances and only dealing with my own limited perspective on how this could possibly work out? 